Hey there, folks, and welcome out to the Single Player Podcast. I'm your one and only host, I'm 16, but I got a good show for this week because it's the Christmas special. We're going to be talking about John Carmack leaving Meta, Super Nintendo World has an open date, and we're going to play some Christmas Nights in the Dream. So sit back, relax, get yourself some hot cocoa, and I'll be with you in a bit. Right, folks, we're back, and now it's time to start the show with my favorite segment, your favorite segment, everyone in the world's favorite segment. It's time for not the gaming forecast because let's be honest here, there really isn't much coming out. Um, I, I looked into it. I and the thing is, like, okay, as you guys know, I use Wikipedia as a source for game releases. The, the thing about Wikipedia is that it's it's good if you're not covering anything that's controversial, <laughs> because for the most part. The information is accurate, but if you're covering politics or whatever the fuck, usually it's one-sided as all hell. So, and so you can't really trust it. But uh, so I, I went to Wikipedia. I looked at at their list of games for this week, and there's literally nothing. The only other game is Sports Story, but that's just two, TBA. So it's like, okay, I can't really. Uh, I'm not really gonna mention that. And then I go to Game FAQs and I look at that, and there's a lot of games on there, but most of it is like really really small releases and most of it is just porn games okay not that i have anything wrong with porn games it's just i it's just like I, i'm not interested in covering any of that so i decided okay let's not actually do the gaming forecast this year because like it's it's there's really not a lot that's really interesting a lot of it is pc games a lot of it is a, a linux or mac really nothing coming out for consoles so i mean there's a couple of nintendo switch stuff but it's again it's nothing really notable so uh, anyway with that being said let's move on to our first topic all right and for our first story we got to talk about john carmack that's right ladies and gentlemen the co-founder of id software creator of wolfenstein 3d doom and quake now a couple of years ago he uh he quit uh, id Software to join Oculus all the way back in 2013 and it appears that after nine years he has officially quit Oculus. That's right ladies and gentlemen. According to Carmack he originally uh, resigned via an internal memo which unfortunately got leaked to the press and they only put, posted a few uh, choice bits from it so he decided to post the entire thing on Facebook. Now of course for brevity uh, I'm not going to quote the entire thing but uh there are some interesting stuff here for example he says and i quote this is the end of my decade in vr i have mixed feelings 
Quest 2 is almost exactly what I wanted to see from the beginning. Mobile hardware, inside out tracking, optional PC streaming, 4K-ish screen, cost effective. Despite all the complaints I have about our software, millions of people are still getting value out of it. We have a good product, it is successful, and successful products make the world a better place. The issue is our efficiency. Some will ask why I care how the progress is happening as long as it is happening. If I'm trying to sway others, I would say that an or organization that has only known inefficiency is ill-prepared for the inevitable competition and or belt tightening. But really, it is more the, the more personal pain of seeing 5% GPU utilization number in production. I am offended by it. We have a ridiculous amount of people and resources, but we constantly self-sabotage and squander effort. There is no way to sugarcoat this. I think our organization is operating at half the effectiveness that would make me happy. Some may scoff and contend we are doing just fine, but others will laugh and say half? Huh, I'm at quarter efficiency. I, it has been a struggle for me. I have a choice at the voice at the highest levels here, so it feels like I should be able to move things, but I'm evidently not persuasive enough. A good fraction of the things I complain about eventually turn my way after a year or two passes and evidence piles up, but I have never actually been able to kill stupid things before they cause damage or set a direction and have a team actually stick to it. This was admittedly self-inflicted. I could have moved to Menlo Park after the Oculus acquisition and tried to wage battles with generations of leadership, but I was busy programming and I assumed I would hate it, be bad at it, and probably lose anyway. Enough complaining. I weary to the fight and have my own startup to run, but the fight is still winnable. VR can bring value to most of the people in the world, and no company is better positioned to do it than Meta. Maybe it actually is possible to get there by just plowing ahead with current practices, but there is plenty of room for improvement. Make better decisions and fill your products with give a damn. Now, here's the thing. I'm not really surprised to hear Carmax leaving or his reasoning why he's leaving, because here's the thing about, about uh, Meta, okay? And I'm sure you can all figure this out, but Meta is a bloated mega corporation. And when that happens, okay, no one listens to you. All right, because you are one of several thousand employees, you're expendable to them, and so basically they're not going to listen to what you're saying or work at maximum capacity. We've seen this happen at numerous corporations, and because of that, I'm not shocked to hear that Carmack is leaving, because here's the thing. Anyone who has ever read Masters of Doom, which is a great book, highly recommend you check it out, um, knows that Carmack is the kind of guy who is all about utilization and efficiency. After all, we're talking about a guy that created an engine that could generate 3D graphics at a much faster pace on an IBM PC in the early 90s. So yeah, he has always been very much the kind of person who is trying to push technology as far as he possibly can. Now, what I find interesting is that his leaving of Meta is very similar to the reason why he left id Software, because at the time, id, of course, was owned by ZeniMax. It was not owned by Microsoft at that point. And uh, he wanted to go full support of the Oculus Rift, but ZeniMax wasn't interested. So he decided to leave uh, ZeniMax to go work at Oculus. And I think at that time, Oculus was not owned by uh, uh, Facebook. I'm pretty sure. Hold on, let me see here. Yeah, I was right. He joined Oculus a year before Facebook bought out uh, the company, which actually resulted in a lawsuit between ZeniMax and Facebook. But uh, anyway... Now, of course, this doesn't mean he's completely out of a job. Uh, he, at the end of the memo, he mentioned his own startup, and what he's referring to is Keen Technologies. Yeah, I see what you did there, John. You named it after Commander Keen. And uh, what it is, it's a company that's focused entirely on uh, artificial general intelligence. So basically, artif AI that is closer to uh, a human being, human intelligence. And uh, I'm not sure if whether to be impressed or to be horrified because, let's be honest here, something like that could possibly lead to the creation of Skynet. So uh, if we start a war against machines, then uh, it's possibly going to be started by the guy who gave us Doom. So uh, anyway, I wish uh, John Carmack all the best, and let's move on to our next story. All right, and next up, we got to talk about Death Stranding. So, uh, as you all know, recently, the sequel, Death Stranding 2, was announced at the Game Awards, but it appears that, that it's not the only Death Stranding-related media to be announced, because recently, uh, 
Kojima Productions announced that there is going to be a film adaptation. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, according to Kojima Productions, they are working with Barbarian executive producer Alex Lebovicki? Vic? Vicky? I don't know how you pronounce that. Of Hammerstone Studios to develop and produce a film adaptation. Uh, it will be fully financed by Hammerstone and produced by Kojima and Lebovic under uh, their respective banners, with Kojima Productions and Alan Unger serving as executive producers. Now, outside of that, there's really not much information. The whole thing is being kept under wraps. And uh, But my guess would be that uh, if they were to cast people, they're most likely going to get the original cast. So people like Norman Reedus, Mad Mickelson, uh, Glamour Del Toro, all of them to probably uh, get into the game. Hey, who knows? Maybe even Jeff Keighley will be in there. I don't know. But uh, this will also mark the first ever uh, feature film by Kojima Productions. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if Kojima directed it himself because the dude has always wanted to be a movie director. In fact, I, I think that was where why he went to college originally. Before he decided to join uh, Konami, he was a film student. And uh, he then played Super Mario Brothers. I think it was Mario Brothers. And he decided he wanted to get into video game development. And so he uh, he dropped out of film school and went to uh, Konami. I'm going based entirely off of memory, but I think that's what happened. Of course, I don't know if a movie like this would actually work because let's be honest here, there's really not much to it. Okay, Death Stranding for the most part is a walking simulator. So I don't know how you could turn that really into a movie. But actually, someone actually tried. You ever heard of a movie called Jerry? It's from 2002, it's a Gus Van Sant film. Um, and it's literally just two guys walking through a desert. That's literally it. In fact, it's funny because it was inspired by video games. Apparently, Gus Van Sant saw his kid playing Tomb Raider and thought it was uh, weird that his child would sit there for hours watching a character move forward, despite the fact that, uh, I, I don't know, she's solving puzzles and shooting enemies. I guess he didn't even notice that, but... Uh, I, I don't know if something like this could actually work as a movie. So, Metal Gear? Possibly. But Death Stranding? Eh, I don't know. Anyway, guys, I'm going to take a short break, and we'll be right back after this. <laughs> like to thank you for taking us into your homes. We wish you all a happy holiday.
All right, folks, we're back, and first up in our next round of stories, we gotta talk about Super Nintendo World, because we finally have a date for when it finally makes its way over to the United States. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. According to Universal Studios, it is going to open at Universal Hollywood on February 17th, 2023. So you got less than two months until it officially opens in the United States. Now, the Hollywood location will basically include everything that's in the Japanese location. So, the Mario Kart ride, the Yoshi ride, all of the interactive games and elements, retail stores, Toadstool Cafe, all of it. Basic, basically, from what I've seen, it's going to be a one-to-one -one recreation of the Japanese park. Now, what is interesting is the timing of it all, because... This is two months before the movie is set to come out, so obviously they, they've timed it so that the park is... They basically have an advertising vehicle open just as the movie comes out. Uh, so they basically timed everything perfectly. Now, obviously the, there is plans for a Orlando park. Uh, the problem is that that's not going to come out for at least another two years. So basically with that, it's not even going to be a section of the existing parks like Universal Studios or Islands of Adventure. Instead, that's going to be part of a completely brand new park called Epic Universe. Now, there's not a lot of information about Epic Universe other than the fact that Super Nintendo World is going to be part of it. Uh, but there's going to be other sections of the park that people have been speculating. It's going to be stuff like How to Train Your Dragon and the Universal Monsters. So, uh, and that's going to, like I said, it's going to take two years for that to open. That, I, I think, if I remember correctly, that was supposed to, uh, they've been trying to ramp up production on it because uh, it got slowed down because of COVID. Like, I think they started it, like, late 2019, early 2020, and then COVID happened, and they had to basically stop uh, work on it for a while, and then reopen it, at, uh, restart, as, uh, as a lot of the restrictions started being lifted. So, uh, they're trying to... Right now, from what I've seen, because I've been following some of the updates on it, they're trying to uh, they're trying to get back on schedule. And it does appear, from what many people have said, it does appear to be on schedule to open in 2025. And when that happens, I might actually go down there and visit it. Because keep in mind, I'm on the East Coast. To me, that's the the uh, the low the the nearest park. So. I, I'm not going to go out to California just to go see uh, Super Nintendo World. I will wait until the Orlando Park opens. So uh, if you're out in California, be on the lookout for the new Super Nintendo World that will open on February 17th of next year. Anyway, let's move on to our next story. All right, and for our next story, we got to talk about Xbox Game Pass because it uh, appears that there might be a new tier added to it. So recently, this was of course reported on Windows Central, but... Uh, their source came from re surprisingly Reset Era, where apparently in Europe, a user had uh, posted about getting a survey from Xbox that uh, hints at a brand new tier added to, games to Game Pass. Apparently, according to the uh, survey, the new tier would be $3 a month, and you would, get, uh, you would still be getting some Game Pass content, but there would be limitations. So, for example, you would get past first-party Xbox games right out of the gate. However, when it comes to new Xbox games, you would have to wait six months. Now, for download-only games, uh, before you play them, you would be forced to watch an ad. And according to this tier, it would also include online multiplayer access. Now, here's what I find very interesting about this, because the thing is, as you all know, uh, right now Xbox Live Gold is $9.99 a month. And if this $3 tier is correct, and it does include online multiplayer, then that would mean that they're basically undercutting their own online service. And the real, the question is, why? Why would you do that? Well, my guess is because they're most likely planning to uh, completely replace Xbox Live Gold with this tier. Now, keep in mind that that's just pure speculation. In fact, there's no there's no evidence that this survey is even remotely true. I mean, once again, even if it was true, it's just a survey, and they're just testing the waters a bit. So, take everything in this segment with a grain of salt but if that's the case if they are considering uh this tier 
then most likely that's what they're that's what's going to replace Xbox Live Gold. And it wouldn't surprise me. Now, personally, I don't know if I would go would go for it because Game Ca Game Pass is something that doesn't really interest me. I know a lot of people like it, but honestly, I don't care. I'm more of I would rather physically own my copies than just focus on digital downloads and such. So uh, it's not really something I I would really go for. But considering the uh, the economically where where we're headed right now, it's probably a good idea to have to uh, lower the price of your online services. So uh, anyway, we're just gonna have to wait and see whether or not this actually is true. But until then, take it with a grain of salt, and until it's confirmed, don't you believe it. Anyway, let's move on to our next story. All right, and next up, we got to talk about the Game Awards because we have some viewership numbers. That's right. According to Jeff Keighley on Twitter, he said, and I quote, This year, the Game Awards hit a new viewership milestone. 103 million live streams. Thank you for making this the most watched Game Awards in history. See you in 2023. And he continued saying on Twitter, TGA delivered over 11.5 million video views of the live stream with a 28% increase in conversation volume year over year, 33% increase in unique authors, and 31% increase in the Game Awards hashtag usage. The show trended number one worldwide, including all top five worldwide trends. The Steam Deck giveaway was definitely a big hit. On Steam, over 9.5 million unique viewers viewed the Game Award live stream with a peak audience of over 850,000 concurrent viewers. Damn. Now, here's the thing. I mean, it's impressive, but I, I kind of wonder why people watched it. Because I guarantee you, it's not because people wanted to see who would win Game of the Year. For the most part, I think it was because of two reasons. One, they want to see what games are going to get announced, but also... I guarantee you most people just wanted to see how much of a train wreck it was going to be. Because, let's be honest here, most people don't take the Game Awards seriously. Most people only watch them because they just want to see it become an absolute train wreck. And this year was no exception. There were a lot of train wrecks this year. And, uh, you know what? I think probably the best part out of the entire uh, award show was, of course... The final moments of, of it when that one kid got up on stage and nominated the award for his uh, reformed uh, orthodox rabbi, Bill Clinton. But uh, even I have to admit that the numbers are pretty damn impressive. So congratulations to Geoff Keighley uh, and, you know, good luck on 2023. Anyway, guys, I'm going to take a short break and we'll be right back after this. <laughs>
All right, folks, and we're back. And now we're going to take a break from all the game news and such. And we're going to play a little bit of Christmas Nights in the Dreams. That's right. Now, the last time I played this was, of course, back in 2019 for the first annual Christmas special. So I've decided to return. And I'm going to basically skip the entire opening because here's the thing, okay? The opening is boring as hell. It's literally this woman who talks in a very, very soft voice like this and it's annoying and it goes on and on and on forever so okay let's load our game actually let me get a little comfortable there we go sometimes i have to adjust myself but i okay and if you notice uh the date is set for uh december 24th it is not christmas eve though obviously so uh i, I only did that because uh what happens is that there's various um there's various things that show up in the game depending on what day and time you're playing it. It's all very time specific. So, all right, let's head into uh, the first character, which is Cl Clarice. Hello, Clarice. <laughs> and you'll now. The last time I played this um, was actually the HD edition that was on Steam. But if you notice, this is not the HD edition. Instead. This is actually the uh, this is the original Saturn version. I've had a copy of, of it for quite a while now, about nine years. So I got it back when no one was really uh, collecting for Saturn, so you can get it for a much uh, better price than today. Now it's kind of ridiculous, but um, anyway, yes, this is an actual legit copy running on the Saturn. And uh, the reason why I didn't play it uh, back in 2019 was because, well. I didn't have the 3D controller, and if you've ever played Nights into Dreams, you know that uh, it 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 plays terribly with an with with a D-pad. Like, I and mean, obviously the game itself was designed around an anal uh, the 3D controller, so obviously that makes sense. But seriously, like, it is it is next to impossible to actually get some really good gameplay with the D-pad version. Uh, which, by the way, yes, I am playing with the 3D controller. And it plays fantastic. In fact, in my opinion, the 3D controller is probably one of the most underrated controllers in gaming. Like, ser seriously, if you ever get the chance, try it out. It is absolutely amazing. Uh, the analog stick, it, it, you know, I'm surprised Sega didn't copy it for the Dreamcast. Because it, it feels comfortable. Basically, what it is, it's, it's, it's an analog stick, but it, it looks kind of like a trackball. But it ha there's an indent for your thumb, so you you don't really like slip off of it, and it feels really comfortable. Like I'm, I'm just kind of surprised they didn't really try to copy this, or why the hell they went with that that crappy D the analog stick on the uh, Dreamcast controller. I don't get it. So I think I have enough time to make do uh, one more lap here, because this one is much shorter than previous laps. So I need to pull this off. And there we go. The thing with this game is that uh, it's all about timing, because first off, you have to uh, you have to constantly do different laps. It's I, I when I first played it, I didn't understand why I kept getting like D ranks, because it just didn't make any sense. And then I realized, oh wait, no, you're supposed to like do multiple laps over and over to kind of like oh come on, thing. There you go. You have to keep doing different laps if, if you want to get a high score. Too bad the game doesn't actually tell you that. Alright. And you have to figure out how many, like, if you have enough time to, like, do one more lap. Because if you, if you don't, what, what happens is, uh... Because it's happened to me many times. If you don't make it back to the uh, start on time, what happens is uh, you turn back to your human child character, and suddenly you have to walk around the entire terrain, and it is annoying because there's a clock chasing you, and if the clock gets you, that's it's game over. So, uh, and there have been times where I have just like. I've made it just when it hits zero, and for some reason the game doesn't count. Count count that as as a clear. Like you're right there, 
And for whatever reason, the game doesn't count that as as 100% clear. And I'm just like, you son of a bitch. Okay, I'm going to have to rush this one. All right, yeah, we're going to have to rush it. Come on, come on. I think I can make it, but... Oh, fuck. Oh, fuck. No, 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 no. No, 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 no. Don't do it. Ah, yes. Got it. Ha, ha. Thought you had me, but you didn't. You son of a bitch. Okay. Get the one over here. Depending on how many links you get, or whatever the hell those those called, those those ball things, okay, you can actually uh, def defeat those Christmas tree things. Well, the Christmas trees in this, but they look like jellyfish in the original game. Uh, you can defeat them in one lap. You normally don't have to like do multiple laps. Mostly, just do multiple laps just to uh, get a higher score. So, like right there. I got them one lap. And uh, whenever you get these ribbon things, always hit L. Just do circles and hit L. Raises your score by quite a bit. Again, this is stuff that I learned simply by trial and error and playing this game for years. But, uh, no. Okay, and we got one more lap, and then we fight the boss. And pretty much the boss in, in this is basically the exact same thing for for both characters. Super easy to defeat. this and we have more than enough to defeat this guy love the music in this game by the way probably some of the best Christmas music in any game I've ever heard Oh, you son of a bitch. Those things are annoying because they capture you and then they they pull you down and it's annoying as hell. Ah, yeah. I don't think I had enough time for one more lap, so. And now we go off to the final boss. <clears throat> this, uh... You know, I think that looks like something from a Tim Burton movie. Come for your daughter, Chuck. You just have to keep doing this over and over again, but you can't just like hang over, hang out by him and just let him respawn. Because, well, you, you can't just wait. Because, uh, essentially, like if you, if I just stood in the same vicinity and just tried to go back and constantly uh, get at him, it wouldn't work. Like, you, you get hit, and then next thing you know, you're, uh, it takes a couple of seconds off your time. And I'm not sure that, that that might be the highest score I've ever gotten with Clarice. I'm not sure. We're just going to have to check. Yes, it is. Okay, awesome. 
Okay, now before we continue, I want to take a break and just uh, check out something called Sonic Mode. Now, this is, as you can see, I've unlocked everything in this game. There's actually quite a lot of content in here. You know, there's there's uh, score attacks, time attack. There's, you can listen to music. There's karaoke somewhere around here. There's, like, movies and and images and such. A lot of interesting stuff to uh, look at, but uh, the one I definitely want to showcase is this. Sonic Mode. And it is exactly what you think it is. It is, in fact, a Sonic version of, uh, of Christmas. It is, it is Sonic in Christmas Nights. Yes. Now, what's interesting about this is that this is actually the very first time Sonic is ever playable in 3D. Yeah, this uh, this actually predates uh, Sonic Adventure, so oh, obviously, Sonic Adventure, Sonic uh, Jam, Sonic R, and of course, Sonic 3D Blast. So uh, this is the first, you, yeah, it's, and it's quite impressive that they were able, that they, uh, because it really shows you what the Saturn was actually capable of. Now, it begs the question of why in the whole, like, okay. So think of it like this. You have, you have a fully 3D engine that runs well, really well on the Saturn. A console that is notorious for, uh, for developers to to work on like it, it is notoriously known for uh not being very not being easy for developers to make games for okay you have not only a 3d engine that runs incredibly well on it but you have a 3d model of sonic why the hell do you then use that to make an entirely brand new game and not just make a sonic game for the saturn like, like, I, I don't, like, I don't get why they didn't just do that. Like, I, okay, I get it. Knights is an entirely new, brand new IP. That's cool and all. But what people want is Sonic. You know, like, Knights is, again, it's an all right game, but I, it's not a system seller. You know what I mean? Like, when people buy a Sega console, at least back then, uh, they, they bought it for Sonic. You know, when people bought the Sega Genesis, they bought it because of the Sonic games. Why not use the the, the technology you, you've created here to create a brand new Sonic game? I, am I crazy? Am I the only one who who's like who's who's thinking this? Like it, it just kind of bothers me because it's like this could have been a great showcase. Now, obviously, I wouldn't make the. Uh, the levels if I were to make a sonic game with this I wouldn't make the levels this hilly because obviously there is no second controller so uh second second analog stick so uh camera control is right out but you could have you could use this for something like that you know you could create a fully 3d sonic game uh with this engine and yet for some reason sonic team just didn't feel the need to I don't know it, there's the the Saturn era is full of coulda woulda shoulda you know there's a lot of things sega could have done and yet they didn't do and it just kind of bugs me that they never did like you you would think you would think it would be like you know uh uh common sense like okay this makes sense we have this this really good engine we have a 3d sonic model okay work work on a sonic game but yet for some reason sonic team just decided not to and instead just simply teased people with this like the oh yeah if you guys want a 3d sonic game well here you go just just make a 3d sonic game like you don't have to do like you don't have to do all this like uh, you, you don't have to create something com entirely brand new i think a part of it also is yuji naka's ego i've talked about it before uh, in past episodes, mostly with his recent arrest, but uh, the dude has a massive ego. Uh, he thinks way too highly of himself. This is someone who goes on and on about how he is the father of Sonic and all that kind of crap, even though he didn't create the character. He only like programmed the first game, and I think like he produced the uh, sequels, and like that's it. 
that's his input on Sonic. So, uh, my guess is that he was like, oh, if I, if, if it has my name on it, it's going to be as, as popular as Sonic. That's probably my guess, and uh, Sega just took a gamble because, unfortunately, Sega just kind of did that. They, they took a gamble. Like, they had these, these great developers who got a little too ahead of themselves and basically were, were like, you know, th thought that everything they would make would be, you know, gold, you know. Yu Suzuki is the same way. I love Yu Suzuki. I love Virtual Fighter, but but dude Shenmue is just like Yes, I am one of those people that doesn't like Shenmue. Yeah, I don't get it. It's not really my type of game. If it's your type of game, all right, but me personally, no. This is, it's not something I'm interested in. But like that's the thing. It's like you know, you had these these you know talented developers at Sega, who just, like, kind of got ahead of themselves, you know what I mean? Oh, just break the damn... There we go. Oh, come on! This, this is... Even in the... Even in Knights, this boss is an absolute pain in the ass. Oh, you son of a... And there you go, he's done. And you'll notice that there is no uh, spin dash. You don't really run too fast. So it's not exactly... Ooh, new record. Nice. Can't really do much. But I think, again, it's a good tech demo for what a, uh, a 3D Sonic game could have been on the Saturn. That we never got. So it's, it's, it's a damn shame. But uh, yeah, that was the Sonic mode. I just wanted to show you that. And now, let's get back to the conclusion of Christmas Nights. And we don't have to worry about playing the uh, the tile game because I unlocked everything in this. So, yeah, there's like all these little extras and such that we that uh, you can unlock. So, anyway, now let's go on to Elliot, the blue-haired boy. Oh, anime. <laughs> Love the lighting on that. Absolutely, it, you know what? This really like Nights in the Dreams really is a good tech demo for what the Saturn could do. In fact, you might notice that the uh, this this actually looks better. Uh, it actually looks really nice, uh, picture quality wise, and that's because so. I got something, I have something called the HG Retrovision cables, which are specially made uh, component cables for certain retro systems. So, for example, they have one for the PS2, uh, the Wii, there's a cable for the Super Nintendo, and they, it outputs a really, really high quality uh, picture. Probably best that, better than I've ever seen on any of these systems. And... Uh, well, I got my hands on the Sega Genesis uh, HD Retrovision cables. Now, what's interesting about those is that they have various add-ons that allow you to play them with other systems that don't have standalone cables. So, for example, there's uh, there's an add-on for the original PlayStation. There's one for, I think, the Turbo Duo and the Neo Geo and the uh, Sega Genesis Model 1. Well, I got the, uh, the add-on for the Sega Saturn. And as you can see, it the game's game looks absolutely gorgeous in component. Uh, absolutely looks amazing. Of course, it's outputting in uh, 240p, but uh, I'm using I'm uh, I have that through the RetroTINK 2X Pro multi format, which again like doubles the lines and just abs makes it abs look absolutely amazing. Uh, this is probably the best I've ever seen the Sega Saturn, and, you know, even including when I recorded for the uh, Panzer Dragoon retrospective. In fact, I've kind of thought about, like, remaking the, the retrospective, keeping the audio, editing it a bit more, and just overall, uh, but improving the, uh, the picture quality of, like, the first two games. First three games, I should say. Because, again, that's, like, that's all in S-Video. And this video looks all right, but um, I don't know. I, I think like the video quality could look much better. 
Maybe not, like, not... I, I might not, like, do it as a more recent thing. Maybe sometime down the line I'll remake the uh, retrospective, but for now, it's not really my uh, my main focus. It's just an idea I've thought about. Like, oh, yeah, you know, now that I have this, this really good equipment, I could, you know, get really good picture quality out of, you know, my Saturn and, and make the retrospectives look much better. Oh, damn. I did it too early. Ah, okay, at least we got A. Not enough, damn. Funny thing is, you always they, 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 there's all these like uh, unlockable th these these things you collect in the game, like like that little uh, was it yellow thing that showed up. I have no idea what the hell that does. There's some power ups where it doesn't really explain to you what it is or what it does. So it's like, eh. Okay, I got it, but I don't know what it does. At least as long as it raises my score, I don't mind. I remember hearing somewhere that uh, I think it was Miyamoto said that there was one game he wished he could make could have made it was Knights. I'm not sure if that's absolutely true. I've never been able to uh, to uh, confirm it or at least find any sort of uh, source for it. But yeah, I remember hearing somewhere that uh, Miyamoto claimed that if there was one game he had ever made, it was Knights in the Dreams. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. I don't think... Yeah, we're not going to have enough time. Okay, let's go back. No, 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 no. Come on, 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 come on. Yeah, but there we go. And now to the fourth lap. It's yeah, still not enough. Eh, we'll come back. Yeah, we got more than enough. There we go. Go, it's done. Oh, you son of a bitch! That would have been perfect. See what I mean? Like these characters, basically, like they'll they'll stop you right mid. Like you'll be doing really well, and then suddenly they'll stop you, and you're like, you son of a bitch. You son of a heart. Okay. Oh, you mother... F oh, you took... Freaking... Oh. Oh. Okay, we're going to have to move our asses then. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not going to have to... Move it, move it, move it, move it, move it, move it. Oh, can we... There we go. And there we go. Okay. We got a perfect four A's on this. Nice. And now we go and fight the boss. Again.
right, and we're almost there. I think this one hit. Yep, there we go. And he's down for the count. All right. And then it turns into a Christmas tree. Wong. And then we get the cutscene. And they got the star for the tree. In seven colors, but the entire story was a dream. So, what was that star? They don't talk about the dream they saw. But there is one thing both of them know. Something special will happen after they embark on an adventure with knights. It was at this moment he knew he fucked up. Whoa, whoa. Boop. They start feeling cheerful again. Don't just stand there, call nine one one. All right, I think this is where I'll take my leave. I just want to take a moment to thank you all, not for just listening to this episode, but for listening to the show in general. I really appreciate you guys tuning in every week. Uh, if you like any of the music in this week's episode, links are in the description. There is also a playlist called Single Player Radio, and it is music from past episodes, so I highly recommend you go check that out. And with that being said, I want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. I'll see you next week, and remember to keep gaming. Just be sure.
Okay, maybe I'm not entirely done. Here's one last treat I got for you guys because it's absolutely hilarious and should be watched every Christmas. So here you go, and I just want to wish you all once again a very Merry Christmas. Peace. 